Welcome to lesson 9a, room ventilation with infiltration. We're going to get more realistic with our room ventilation analysis. So today we're going to talk about infiltration and exfiltration. Infiltration is also called air leakage. We're talking about leakage into and out of the room. I'm going to be using QS and QE, and we formerly had set those equal to just Q, but now QE is not necessarily equal to QS. That's because we're also adding infiltration and exfiltration and Q infiltration is not necessarily equal to Q exfiltration, although we'll often make that approximation. For example, you have a room uh, at a much lower pressure than atmosphere, then you're only going to have Q infiltration. You won't have any exfiltration. If the opposite is the case, you have a high pressure room, you're not going to have any air coming in from outside, only air going outside. That will be exfiltration. Let's look at infiltration first. Infiltration is uncontrolled. Uncontrolled means it's just happening by itself as opposed to the forced ventilation. Infiltration is uncontrolled leakage of outside air into a building. Exfiltration is uncontrolled leakage of air from a room or building. We'll, we'll use kind of room and building interchangeably here to the outside. CA is the ambient or outside air. So that is what's coming in with infiltration. When you have exfiltration, CEXF is just C because, again, well mixed. Just as CE was C, CEXF is also C. Where do we get infiltration? From cracks in walls, from seals in windows and doors. Sometimes people analyze this infiltration with doors that actually open. If you're opening and closing doors, some air is coming in. If you have open windows, that's kind of a special case where you have a lot of air coming in or going out. Holes in walls. You say, I don't have any holes in my wall. Yes, you do. There's holes for electrical outlets. Also the same for plumbing. Look under your sink where the pipes come in and where the drain goes out. There's a hole right through the wall, right through the floor. You have corners in walls, like at the baseboard and stuff where walls come together. This is not a perfectly sealed joint. And at the floor, the drywall and the floor are not mated exactly. And you put a baseboard over that to cover it up, but there's still going to be leakage through there. And Seth, is that also where bugs come in? I'm afraid so, Boris. I hate bugs. Me too, Ned. Me too. Uh, thank you, sir. Fireplaces, etc. The HVAC system itself, the ducts that bring this supply air in and take the return air out, and they cut a hole in the wall or in the ceiling to do that, and there's some leakage around that. So there's all kinds of places where there can be infiltration and exfiltration. Why is there infiltration and exfiltration? The simple answer is there's a pressure difference, delta P, between inside and outside. Delta P is P outside minus P inside. If delta P is positive, in other words, the outside is bigger than the inside, you're going to have infiltration. You have a high pressure outside and you have a low pressure inside, air is going to seep through those cracks in the wall and come in. If the pressure difference is negative, the air is going to go out. Sometimes you can have, as I mentioned already, infiltration and no exfiltration or vice versa. In a lot of situations, they're pretty much balanced. There's a problem though. P outside does not equal a constant at all walls and ceiling. Why is that? because of wind. Wind will be a big factor in this. So we get a little bit of fluid mechanics here. This is the ground and here's a building or house and we have some wind view. From fluid mechanics we know that you're going to get a stagnation region here so this will be a region of high pressure. You're going to get a vortex coming off this roof here. You're going to get a big vortex in the wake and so you're going to have a low pressure region here. So you may get some infiltration in this portion of the house, and you may get some exfiltration in this portion of the house due to the low pressure. So we'd have delta P plus here and delta P negative here. Also, infiltration and exfiltration go up as wind speed goes up. 
So if you have a very high wind, you're going to get a lot of infiltration. You can actually hear this air whistling through some of these cracks on a very windy day. Temperature also influences the infiltration and exfiltration. Let's define delta T is T outside minus T inside. If you have a cold winter day, so again, let's look at our house. Let's not worry about wind, but on a winter day, delta T is negative because the outside is cold, the inside is warm. And suppose we have a nice fireplace not on. The problem with the fireplace is that it has a chimney coming out of the fireplace. You have cold air up here and you have nice warm air in the house and therefore you're going to have a draft. It's going to draw air from the room and then out of the chimney. This is going to draw air out. This would be an exfiltration because it's drawing air out of the house. We also call this a draft or a stack effect. The other thing is if you have wind, so let's look at this portion if this is our stack coming up and you have wind blowing over it and that air is coming out, what's going to happen is because of the Bernoulli effect, you have a low P here. So it's going to draw even more air out of the house. So there's more exfiltration. What I want to do now is look more quantitatively. A couple comments before we get to equations. Infiltration and exfiltration are typically in units of air changes per hour. Recall for a room, we had N equal Q over V, the flow rate divided by the volume. So this is the number of room air changes per hour. People also use ACH is the same as N, but it's typically used for a building, whereas N is used for a room although some people use this interchangeably. I will use an inf for the infiltration room air changes, and all of these have units of one over hour. I'll point you to, for example, table 5.4 in our textbook. These are some common infiltration room rates for windows and things like that, but this is from 1981, which was fairly current when we wrote the book, but things have gotten a lot better since then. So unless you have a much older house, we have to look for some updated values for infiltration rates. There are numerous tables, charts, empirical equations to estimate infiltration in buildings. Also, people do research, and mostly in architectural engineering, on how to reduce infiltration. Here's just a sample, a research paper where they were looking at vestibule versus no vestibule in offices, warehouses, malls, schools, etc., I'll pick a sit-down restaurant, the corner room or some restaurant like that. They were looking at infiltration rate through doors with vestibules and without vestibules. And these are actual experimental data. And this is CFM, cubic feet per minute. For peak situation where you have people coming in and out, doors opening all the time and closing, you can see that without a vestibule, you have about 1,300 CFM infiltration. And with a vestibule, you've cut that down to 826. So this concludes that a vestibule, which is like an entrance area where you come in the main doors from outside, and then there's another set of doors to go through to actually get in the room where you're eating. So the vestibule has reduced infiltration by 0.63. Infiltrated air costs money to heat or cool, depending on if it's winter or summer. And so you want to try to avoid infiltration. The bottom line is that N infiltration depends on the construction, not just the type of construction, but the quality of construction, the type and quality of the doors themselves, doors, windows, along with delta P, delta T, as we just talked about, and a whole bunch of other things. ASHRAE, American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, they have guidelines for buildings, and that is that N infiltration must be greater than or equal to 0.35 one per hour. You need to have about a third of the room change per hour. Otherwise, if it's not that, you would have unhealthy air. There's too many people breathing. What ASHRAE says is that if the natural infiltration is less than 0.35 one over hour, then you require forced ventilation. But I used to teach this just in terms of cost. 
infiltrated air costs money to heat or cool. Lower infiltration is good because there's lower HVAC cost, but it's bad for health because you're breathing that stale air. And in these days, it's also bad if you have diseases in the air, flus are now COVID. You want a lot of infiltration. For COVID, a large N inf is best. So we have this dilemma. If you have a real high infiltration and some of the CDC recommendations for indoor air now is that you keep a window open, well, that's fine when it's nice outside, but when it gets to be 20 degrees or 10 degrees outside, you don't want to have a window open. But if you did, you would have much healthier air inside the room, but you're going to pay for it. You're going to have to heat that. There's all kind of empirical equations. I'm not going to use any of them except this one. This is the simplest one and it's a nice easy one to use. This is just an engineering equation. You have to have the correct units to get the correct answer. The wind speed is in mile per hour, T is in degree F, and N then is one over hour. And this is the equation. It's called the Wadden and Chef equation. Example, suppose we have 10 mile per hour wind and delta T is 30 degrees F. So this is a typical nice fall weather in Pennsylvania. And so N infiltration is equal to 0.315 plus 0 0.0273 times 10. You don't put any units in, just put the numbers, plus 0 0.0105. Notice this is absolute value up here for temperature because they're saying that whether it's cold outside or hot outside compared to inside, you still have some infiltration due to that temperature difference. So we take the absolute value here it's 30, and that's in degrees F, so we don't put any units. And when you plug everything in, you get 0 0.903, one over hour. Typical buildings, N infiltration varies from around 0 0.5 to two or three, one over hour. Now let's get into the meat of how do we analyze this. So let's look at ventilation analysis with infiltration and exfiltration. What we're gonna do is a mass balance, Previously, all we had was a Q coming in with CS, QS, CS, and the same Q coming out. So we didn't need to do a bulk air mass balance, but we have to do that here. For the bulk air, we have conservation of air volume flow rate. We'll assume the densities are pretty much constant, even though the temperatures can be different. So use an average density. So QS plus Q infiltration must equal QE plus Q exfiltration. We have two sources into the room of bulk air and we have two sinks out of the room of bulk air. The room doesn't know or care whether the air leaves by QE or Q exfiltration. What I mean by that is this, if you look at these two outflows, they're both at the C inside the room. So if you think about it from a mathematical point of view, as we're analyzing this room, suppose the room is a very low pressure compared to the outside. So there's no exfiltration. So all the air has to come out through the normal exhaust. Or suppose your exhaust is blocked somehow, then whatever you're forcing in here, plus whatever comes in through infiltration is gonna all have to come out through exfiltration. But typically it's a combination of these two, but since they both have C as their concentration, it doesn't really matter. So QE and QEXF often occur together in an equation because they both have the same mass concentration. But QS and QINF are different because the C concentration is different. It's CS for the supply and it's CA for the infiltration. So keep that in mind. This will become important later when we do recirculation. Let's look at the mass conservation of the contaminant. What do we have coming in? We have QS times CS, a QINF times CA here, and we have a source. So we can start constructing our conservation equation as follows. VDCDT is QSCS plus Q infiltration CA plus source. These are all sources. And then we'll subtract all the things that are coming out. QE times CE and QX times CX and the wall losses. So these are all sinks we convert to standard ODE form. 
The key, as I've said many times, is to collect all the terms with a C and all the terms without the C. We get DC DT equal QSCS plus QINFCA plus S over V minus QE plus Q exfiltration plus KWAS all divided by V. And that whole thing is multiplied by C. B is equal to this collection of terms, and A is equal to this collection of terms without the minus sign. And from here on, everything is the same as previously once you get your equation in this standard form. CSS is B over A, for example, et cetera. So let's do one example, very similar to a previous example we had, except now I've added infiltration and exfiltration we have our parameters. So let's just identify these room volume, V number of forced room air changes. This is what we just call N through the ventilation system. The contaminant concentration in the supply air, the outside ambient air, the source strength, the wall adsorption coefficient, the surface area of materials that adsorb T outside and T inside, and the average wind speed is U in miles per hour and we need to estimate the mass concentration of the contaminant at steady state conditions in milligram per meter cubed. So this is similar to previous problems, except now we have to go to this Wadden and Chef equation to figure out an inf, plug in U and T outside minus inside absolute value, and you get an infiltration is 1.057, one over hours. Interestingly, in this case, 1.057 is pretty close to N itself. So you're putting almost the same amount of air forced in as you are getting naturally from the infiltration, where we have to calculate QS is equal to N times V. And that turns out to be 1.19, one over hours times 53.8 meter cubed. So that's equal to 64.02 meter cubed per hour. And then Q infiltration is N infiltration times V, 1.057, one over hours, 53.8 meter cubed. And that becomes 56.57 meter cubed per hour. And we also have the bulk air, QE plus QEXF is equal to QS plus QINF. I don't really care how the split is between QE and QEXF. I don't care how much goes out this exit and how much goes out this exit since they both have the same C. All I care about is the total QE plus QEXF. And that appears together in this denominator. So we're going to let that equal QS plus QINF. We have QS and we have QINF. So now we're going to plug in everything into that equation to get our final answer. So I threw in all the numbers. The only unit conversion I need is right here, 3,600 seconds per hour. And I get 1.74 milligram per meter cubed. Compared to the case with no infiltration, let QINF equal zero here and QEXF equals zero. And I got CSS is equal to 2.55 milligram per meter cube, which of course is bigger. Infiltration helps to lower CSS, but it will cost more dollar to heat in this case. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos. One, two, three. That's all there is to it.